Today's podcast delves into the mind-bending world of deepfakes. Deepfakes are AI-based machine learning technologies which can seamlessly map source-moving image onto target-moving image, often used to map one person's face onto another person's body, often used in news, politics, pornography and art. Artist Max Mauro Schmidt discusses how this is done technically and debates some of the epistemological ramifications of this with Professor Hans Bernhard. Deepfakes work by using huge datasets and powerful processors to generate spastically probable, realistic models of reality. But what happens when we experience these generated clips? Are we able to perceive their uncanny nature? Or do we simply believe them? Indeed, what separates our experience of a deep fake from our experience of any other video clip whose provenance we are unsure of. Are notions of fake and real really useful in trying to parse these moving images? Are the critical faculties required to live in a world in which binary constructions have broken down a cognitive burden? Is it possible to look at these technologies affirmatively? Good day. Welcome, Max. Hi. Welcome to the Octopus, the, our um, season one uh, podcast of uh, by the Black Mirror Institute and the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne, recorded in the studio of the KHM in Cologne. Today's guest is an artist, and he's also a student at the um, Academy of Media Arts in Cologne. Our topic today is called Deep Fakes. And I'd just uh, like to give you a quote from The Guardian. What they write is, There exist on the internet any number of videos that show people doing things they never did. Real people, real faces, close to photorealistic footage. Entirely unreal events. These videos are called deep fakes. And they're made using a particular kind of AI. Inevitably enough, they began in porn, logically. Everything begins with porn. There is a thriving online market for celebrity faces superimposed on porn actresses' bodies. But the reason we're talking about them now is that people are worried about their impact on our already fervid political debate. Deepfakes themselves are kind of, a, it's, it's actually the term for a very narrow uh, phenomenon, which is... I mean, as you as you read, it it uh, originated from porn, and the name is made up basically of deep learning, which is AI-based uh, machine learning technologies, and fake. And uh, as you said, it was mostly used to fake celebrity faces into porn movies. So this is actually where the word comes from. And uh, now the debate is focusing on a wider issue, which is. Um, also related to what people call fake news. People tend to believe what they see on a video and hear on the audio with the video. Um, they tend to believe this even more than written fake news, I would say. I, I think this is why the US House of Representatives and the British government is looking into these issues. So we have basically all the material we need, right? So there is millions, billions of selfies of people and uh, from famous people there is like celebrities there is tons and tons of material out yeah. there that's what is needed right yeah maybe you can explain us quickly the process how it actually works yeah it kind of replaces manual like after effects manual faking labor just by these machine learning processes and i mean there's there are different softwares out there right now open source on github or whatever uh, i think it originated in 2017 from um, a reddit thread also this is where the name then definitely comes from because the the thread or whatever was called deep faker or i think the this is like the handle of the guy who who posted the software first and then there have been different modifications of the software but um, yeah you can just download the code from github basically and they're also like ready made face sets what you were pointing out especially with celebrities because you can either take like single video frames from youtube or just different images that are on the web so they're huge uh, face sets most prominently of nicholas cage and donald trump so you have these face sets 
and then you take a movie like a, a movie sequence yeah and it def and and the, the machine uh, identifies the face in both the source face set the face you want to put on top of the movie and the movie itself there's like a first uh, step in the algorithm that just puts this this um, well-known face recognition mask like facial landmarks basically on eyes nose like general head position so it kind of tracks the the face and the facial features and then maps a mask on top of this and uh, as i said this is happening for the source and the target uh, face set this is outside of the machine learning process but then these uh, modified or aligned faces they get um, fed into this machine learning ai application basically and then you just run it on the gpu for a lot of time like 10k iterations or more and then slowly you see uh, the face evolving from from gray basically like this is what it looks like visually so the computer tries to learn what the face looks like from different positions. And if there's no source image that matches a specific position in one frame, then it will try to, to get like the average of, of multiple frames. So it's basically learning pixel by pixel, but according to these facial landmarks that it mapped out before. So in the end, it's creating some sort of reality. It's trying to create a realistic model, but that can predict what a face would look like from a position that it never saw before. So it's inventing reality because we have a, a real face set and we have a sequence, a real movie sequence, and, and it's just melting this together. This still I would consider as some form of reality. That's why also I would like to talk about the, the terminology because the, the fake news terminology is, is, an, is an absurdity, for example, because there are no real news. The deep fake is a, is a nicer word because it's a, it's a combination of, the, of deep learning and fake. Uh, but it still, it still implies this kind of common reality that we all subscribe to. Maybe you remember the original Blade Runner movie where there is this one sequence where Harrison Ford character, he asks the uh, operator to zoom into an image. And this is a classical error that has been has happened in the last 30 years that people think that they by just simply zooming in, you can get more information. Blow up would blow be up. a famous example. Blow up is, is the best example. Thank you. Exactly. So this is a this was a fiction which is now becoming reality because now the machine is actually doing that. Yeah, I think perception might be the key word because what is reality in these terms i don't think deep fakes or artificial intelligence or machine learning or something it doesn't really produce reality from from scratch or something i would more describe it as building a model of of reality like it, it it's basically it's very technologically sophisticated methods of statistics or stochastics modeling basically it's looking for correlation more generally speaking not about deep fix but about machine learning and ai it's just statistical uh, algorithms basically that take given data and then extrapolate the the models they build or fill the gaps or predict or something prediction is a word that often comes into play when you talk about ai also so this is the thing but i don't know when it becomes reality it just becomes reality if you accept the model as one that uh, is able to describe a world and if you accept these extrapolated properties or descriptions or something as reality it's also how much you trust in these statistics and who sets the parameters for what has to be observed which correlations to find and then yeah in the end it's it's still a black box no one really knows what it does because it's really hard to tell what an ai actually learns and then you can you can just check if the results match what you wanted it to do but you don't know what exactly are the characteristics it, it takes into consideration most of the time so this is really interesting because that's where go, that's where we go into a direction I think also where people are scared only an, an ai algorithm can identify a deep fake for example this is what what has been talked about now it's one of the technical solutions people try to find for technological problems basically so i don't know if it's if it's a good way to go but 
Yes, this would be in a, a typical AI application, basically, is where a human side is not able to tell a difference. A computer could because it, it just looks in different ways. This is a form of, but again, then this will be a form of adversarial learning because we will have uh, deep fakes that are produced uh, in a black box. So we just throw in some images, some movies, and then something else comes out. Then we can design another black box that is able to, to tell us whether, for example, this is being done by different sources. But then if you think this further, these, these two black boxes are st or will start to interact with each other. This yeah. is already happening. I mean, this is the basic principle of this deep fake algorithm. Mostly they are based on so-called GANs, which is a generative adversarial network. This means already both components are there. There's like one that has certain characteristics by which to tell this is fake and this is real. And there's another one that tries to fool the first one and, and tries to find something that, that the first one will think is real. And then these are constantly in, in conversation, so to say, or like an adversarial conversation, basically. I think the job of the artists or people who are maybe not working that goal-oriented or are not working in IT environments or in Silicon Valley with, with clear objectives, um, we have the the luxury but also the responsibility to feel certain things or to to let our intuition play do you feel anything when you work with this are you scared my initial kind of impulse why i got across this topic and why i discovered this code and stuff was like just this uncanny feeling of watching these still imperfect fake videos basically what sticks just like feeling wise or aesthetics wise i think it's very it's kind of repulsing and very uncanny just to see these warped faces that kind of jitter and these unnatural expressions because you mentioned Blade Runner before like it's an it's a reoccurring topic of something that looks like a human but doesn't act like one or has no other properties of a human being than other than the look and I think this is where the fascination comes from in a way. You know, I know how you look because I've seen you a few times, but I don't know how I know how you look. So when I see you, I know who you are. But if I look at you, your, your, your appearance to me is very formalistic and it's based on preconceptions. So if I start to look at you more in, in details, it might completely change. The, the basic concept of, of machine learning as was conceived of, I don't know, in the, in the 50s, or 40s even, is to model it as people thought the human brain would work, but I'm not sure if this is this is true. I think we should just accept that it's like a technology, but it's fundamentally different from how human or like organic brains work. This wish to model the world in machines, to model model reality or model ways in which our brain or whatever works, I think this is a conception that you come across very often, but I'm not sure if it's if machine learning or so-called AI is really doing this. I think what is being modeled is just a correlation of inputs and outputs. So you basically you have you have a set of of inputs of data and then you look for correlations and no one really knows, you know, you can't even extract this after the learning process is is closed. You don't know what it really did, just you can tell, okay, the output is right, so we'll take this. This is really important to keep in mind that it's just looking for correlations. And this is also an interesting part about this technology, that it's also for scientific applications. It's not looking for causalities anymore, it's just looking for correlations, literally. Like, it, the whole analytical part is dropped in favor of just finding relations that... Uh, that lead to true predictions basically on and then this is thought of as intelligent but it will create reality it does create reality that's the fucking cool thing i i see your point the mistake that i'm also making or that a lot of a lot of humans are making is trying to see the machine as something that is very close to to a human and it is not because if you talk about facial recognition with, uh, which is used in deep fakes we talk about uh, sound recognition the machine is not analytical in the sense of it makes no interpretation in this sense. It no. makes no sense. Like it's a statistical thing, but in the end, it's also speculative. 
I I would say it's complex in in the way that there's so many decisions one after the other that in the end it's it's really it's not it's not that binary anymore but it's just like a complex aggregation of binary decisions in in, in a way then we also have to look at where does the the actual funding come from and i think in history it's mostly been the military field where it's getting employed then weirdly pornography is is right now is constantly there also with vr like vr and this deep fake thing is like a porn thing which is obvious on, on one hand but kind of odd on, on the other and then also things that are sellable this is also part of what what the um, house of representatives in the u.s discussed this these deep fakes for example they're making is something we, we have to talk about but also their propagation through social networks and these are driven by it's a click and share enterprise basically so um the deep fakes will most probably be very provocative because no one would bother doing one if it's not provocative or not something something out there and then people are willing to share it just because it's like Yeah, because this is also how how money is generated in these in these ways. So I don't know. I think a lot of future AI um, development will be dominated by the business and by the military applications and stuff. And there are tons of useful applications, but I think they are under underdeveloped or will, will be how do you mean underdeveloped in in comparison to to military applications and to uh, like oh so yeah we're capitalist we're... applications so very specific specific kind of ai applications and maybe not the ones that are most helpful or most interesting i mean maybe we could go a little bit back because i was just talking about the searing in the in the u.s house of representatives another thing that they talked about there and that are repeatedly read about is this whole question of how are we able to tell truth f from fake and what really uh, struck me in a way was this they it has a term it's called the liar's dividend the scenario there's there's like a fake video and and like i'm being made into saying something that i that i've never said they were really worried about this with the 2020 election this is one side of the coin but then the other one especially if you look at the current president of the united states for example that it could be imagined that that he just flips it upside down you know saying like no this is a fake but actually it was was real you know like i never said grab them by the pussy this, this is like the this is what they mean with the term liar's dividend yeah it was perfect. really confusing no it was perfect it's perfect because it demonstrates that we have been living in a fucking fantasy we have been living in a in a construction it, we are like fucking believe we believe in in the in this binary construction of truth and wrong and right and truth and false and, and zero and one as if we were catholics from the middle ages I, yeah, I, I subscribe to what you say on the narrative level, but not on the level where a single person would would do or say something that they actually never did. This is ob they're, they're the distinction between between truth and, and. But it's not true. You don't know. It's true. So, no, you sometimes you're drunk. You have no fucking idea what you said and did. Sometimes you're on drugs. You have no idea what you did. Okay. Sometimes you are tired and you say things and you think you said something else. And, and we don't know because it's only vibrations. It's only sound waves that are coming out of my mouth. You can do and say and think whatever you, you want because the construction doesn't hold up. The ideology is broken. Trump is perfect because, yeah, sure, he's going to come with that. He, 100%. He already did. He already said, no, this, this track grab by the pussy video is a fake. He just says it because for him... Everything is, is all about him. That the problem with Trump is his psychopathology and his position in the world. Not the way he acts, because he acts correctly. But he acts super irresponsibly. So it's correct, because the world is an irresponsible place, and it's a chaotic place, and it's an uncontrollable place. The Catholic Church, the schools, the universities, the mass media, they fulfilled our expectations by telling us what is right and wrong. And it was very helpful and very, very soothing and very simple in a way. So now we have all the technologies and maybe we could affirmatively look at it and say maybe maybe this will help us 
instead of just being scared all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It I I would agree that this is this could be this could have also good potential because looking at at what is the political debate around these things, I I think it's quite disappointing to just see people insisting on there has to be some basic truths we all agree on and this is the usual things you hear about oh we're afraid of deep fakes and stuff so i don't know if it's really important to tell truth from from fake but just being able to navigate in in your own way in inside of this uh really like complex and confusing uh world and maybe also the institutions don't don't fit this kind of you know they don't really fit in this time because they're kind of rigid and not not willing and not able to adapt to these these new circumstances but um yeah i mean there are still it's it's pretty dangerous because not everyone is, is as you said your kids are something like 14 and and grew up with this shit and have like a different different uh sensory approach to a different criticality i would also say and also i think it just can you make you paranoid if you're critic of everything you see you know like it's schizophrenic and you know and there's also like this delusion concept of schizophrenia it could also be something positive but i'm not sure it comes with a lot it just asks a lot uh, from people and there's still like the majority of people doesn't really know how to handle this you know i think it really stems from this feeling of people just being overwhelmed by complexity and looking for simple answers i mean this has been said so many times it's kind of a cliche but i think it's it, but it's is. not true it's I'm, not true if you look at what we found out in the alt-right i almost killed myself in terms of thinking about it I, for two years i was i did not understand how it was possible for the right which i also assigned this kind of binary thinking, this kind of white and black and, 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 and simple answers and, and populism as something like a binary. And I found out that's not the way they operate anymore. That's the old model. The, they, they copied, they copied from the left and the left is completely in, incapable now to, to adapt because they copied and what they do. And the, the trick I think is they are capable of accepting contradiction and the moment and that's also for artists super important the moment you are able to experience and work with contradiction and that's also what trump does he says a and b on the next day and a again and c and he doesn't give a fuck yeah sure yeah and that, it's that true, but I was more talking about the the narrative they present mm. to the outside. Absolutely, like I agree. The, what what they would write down in their party program, yeah, yeah. their election program, yeah, or yeah. something. And the the yes, the strategies are are much different, much more um, clever. You have to admit, people in power realize that it can be very very helpful to just put up so much confusion because yeah you're just doing contradictory things all the time that in the end no one is really able to to tell like how to how to take it or something there was this very nice term someone used it was called reality apathy and i think it, <laughs> it matches this feeling quite well and then if you look at actual actual political tries to engage with these topics it's it, some some things are just so ridiculous i don't know i've I've been reading this eu paper on uh like recommendations how to how to deal with artificial intelligence developments and it's just it's ridiculous what they write like ar artificial intelligence should should uh, take into consideration human values and humans first and stuff like this this is what they write down and this is what experts made up in a year of work basically and it's just there's nothing in this paper. If you go to their website, as a depiction for AI development, they they use this picture of a human hand shaking a robot hand. And this is like, <laughs> this is so funny. It didn't change in 30 years, this picture. We don't want to deal with, uh, with Chinese uh, ideology or, or mentality. And we have closed our own eyes uh, towards the development that happened. Yeah. And that has created, Put, uh, created a lot of problems, for, especially yeah. for the European Union. I think it's very connected to to this current AI hype and stuff, this idea of 
human enhancement and this supposed intelligence without a body and yeah how it feeds into narratives of of possible human enhancement if you look at people like ray kurzweil or elon musk yeah i don't know if you have any ideas on that I have just been in Vienna at the um, OFI, that's the Austrian uh, f uh, sci uh, Scientific Institute for Artificial Intelligence, where I actually studied 25 years ago, and I never understood a fucking word what they were saying, because it's highly mathematical. They were working probably in uh, machine learning algorithms and stuff like that, but completely theoretical. Okay. There was an inter interesting person talking about the Human Brain Project. And the Human Brain Project is amazing. And it's, it's, it's basically one guy who sold it, yeah, in a way, sold it to the, to the funding agencies. He says, I'm going to make a brain simulation. Obviously, you can't do that. Yeah, we all know that. Yeah, you start to smile the, the moment I mention it. But the interesting thing is you can learn a lot from it. And for me, for example, what I learned is that there are about 10 different layers on which you can operate when you want to emulate something like that or to simulate something like that. For me, the question of simulation is also a, a, a problem mm -hmm. because I do not subscribe to simulation anymore. I think we should think in uh, realities, in worlds. So by saying you don't, you don't, you disagree on this notion of simulation, you mean it's not, it's not uh, a good term to describe what's happening it's not a simulation it's real this is what yeah. you're trying to say yeah yeah my thinking's changed in terms of i say no 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 let's not uh, an earthquake simulation let's not say this is simulation this is this is actually just a world they're creating they're creating a world within a, a machine yeah but a very simplified world and a world with certain parameters so i i don't know in the end it's about modeling the world yeah. and then You have a model, but just has certain properties of the real world. You know, you pick some properties that you think are very important to depict or to simulate the, the processes that are happening. But then you, you are lacking so many other properties that then just end up as one random seed or something. I don't know, but still you're missing so much complexity and materiality. I think it's, it's rather questionable if it should be confused with reality but for me is again a subjective perceptive uh, level i say no for me i just accept it as a world i accept it that there is parallel worlds there is different worlds there is different perspective on the world or on what we call the the world because it's not one world there is there is several yeah several viewpoints there is several layers and that's what was so interesting in the human brain project because you have to look at it from different layers you can look at it from a network layer you can look at it from a molecular layer you can look at it from a synaptical layer But so now in the emulation there is only about three layers you can do at the same time in the end You only can look at tiny elements of the brain and you can simulate them. The next question is, okay, so if we understand the brain as, uh, as a processing device that uses sensory input, then you have to think about embodiment. It's not possible to think the brain without embodiment. What we need in the end is a model and a simulation, let's call it simulation, of the universe Yeah. On, a, on every atom of the universe, because otherwise we cannot do the brain uh, 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 simulation or the yeah. brain project. That was the Octopus uh, a podcast about deep fakes and so much more, practically live from uh, the Black Mirror Institute and the um, research group NETZE, our networks, from the Academy, Academy of uh, Media Arts in Cologne, the KHM in Köln. And we thank you for listening and um, being with us and have a nice one. Ciao. Bye. Processes that are happening, but then you you are lacking so many other properties that then just end up as one random seed or something. I, I don't know, but still you're missing so much complexity and materiality. I think it's it's rather questionable if it should be confused with reality. But for me, it's again a subjective, perceptive uh, level. I say, no, for me, I just accept it as a world. I accept it that there is parallel worlds, there is different worlds, there is different perspective on the world, 
or on what we call the the world because it's not one world there is there is several yeah several viewpoints there is several layers and that's what was so interesting in the human brain project because you have to look at it from different layers you can look at it from a network layer you can look at it from a molecular layer you can look at it from a synaptical layer but so now in the emulation there is only about three layers you can do at the same time in the end you only can look at tiny elements of the brain and you can simulate them. The next question is, okay, so if we understand the brain as, uh, as a processing device that uses sensory input, then you have to think about embodiment. It's not possible to think the brain without embodiment. What we need in the end is a model and a simulation, let's call it simulation, of the universe yeah. On, a, on every atom of the universe, because otherwise we cannot do the brain uh, uh, simulation or the yeah. brain project. That was the Octopus uh, a podcast about deep fakes and so much more, practically live from uh, the Black Mirror Institute and the um, research group Netze, our networks, from the Academy, Academy of uh, Media Arts in Cologne, the KHM in Köln. And we thank you for listening and being with us and have a nice one. Ciao. Bye.